Hello and welcome to the Business Book Club and in this episode we're going to be looking at Talk Like Ted, nine public speaking secrets from the world of Ted. Now you can't ignore the extraordinary success of Ted as a platform but also as a way of sharing big brave ideas. We've got a couple of people to join us here today, Dorcas Crawford from Edwards & Co and of course Laura from BDO. Dorcas, what did you think of this book? Oh, I love this book, it's one of my favourite all time books. Well, look, if we go all the way back, you've done a TED Talk. How was it? Uh, yeah. It was a great thing to do, but I was glad when it was over. When it came to you preparing your TED Talk, what specific lessons did you take away from this book? Um, so the two that I've mentioned already, telling a good story, engaging people, being authentic. So telling things as you are, who you are, and letting your own personality come through that. Um, also, uh, one of the other real messages he talks about in here is what makes your heart sing, or being passionate about things and letting people see that you're passionate. And that, I think, really engages people as well. I know from my own experience listening to many, many TEDs, you get caught up in somebody else's passion. So I included that in my talk because it was easy because I was passionate about what I was talking about. So as an accountant, what are some of the key things that you've taken away from this? Because let's face it, business, regardless of the industry today, is built on communication. How important has the book been to you? Really important because communication as an accountant is key. But what it really taught me about was how to make my communication more passionate how to make it more novel and I think one of the takeaways that I had is every story is a data with soul. So how do I bring soul to that data? How do you make it more exciting? Um, but yeah, there's a lot in this book. It's really, really good. One thing that Carmine mentions heavily in the book is the importance of mastery. Now, both of you in your industries have to be masters of your domain as a lawyer, as an accountant. How easy is it for you to get that across? Again, I would really focus on authenticity. I think if you can be authentic in everything you do, um, people will then believe in you and have confidence in you. And just being alert to being innovative, mm -hmm. I think also then makes you almost look like a master because you're always looking, how can I do this differently? How can I do, you know, they talk about being novel. How can I do this in a novel way that nobody else has done? I'm not saying that's the right way, but even the fact that you've considered it, I think makes people look at you differently. Some of the best TED Talks that I've seen actually are ones that I disagree with and I think yes. that's part of the fun of it because you'll either learn something brand new that you can apply or you'll realise, you know what, I think the way that we're already doing it is, is, is pretty good. Do you know the one thing that we haven't touched on that the book touches on really well is? You have to make your audience laugh. Now, I'm not, talking, I'm not talking about rolling in the aisles, but they have to laugh because it's part of an identification. It creates endorphins. And yours was funny when we talked about those, those hungry kids when you arrived home in your TED Talk. You... And he talks about, he, I think the line he uses is, the brain loves humour. The brain absolutely loves humour. It warms us up to other people. It makes us human. And people just love to laugh. It makes you feel better. And then somehow, the, the learning centres in the brain are switched on by that humour happy feeling and therefore you remember the stuff as well. If I could be a wee bit controversial, what didn't work for you? Is there anything in the book that, that you read and you just thought, I have no idea how to make this work in my talks or in my life, in my work? When he talks about the jaw-dropping moments, which the concept is great, you know, always include a jaw-dropping moment that makes people go, um, that's not easy to do Not and I thought practical. and sometimes I reread several bits they're probably marked where I thought what, what is he yeah I didn't I that was the one thing that didn't spell out for me whereas everything else I could totally get yeah. it's a bit, a bit like the bit where they say about bringing your villains and your community and that yeah. sort of thing and making everything go really wrong to make it because sometimes things don't go really wrong before they come better sometimes things just go on a trajectory and do okay had you read it before you gave your TED talk do you think no, you no. okay? And now having read it, would your TED talk be different? I don't think it would. I think that I hope. I think that I accidentally did most of the things inside the book. So, 
who were the town folk and the, you know, the villain in your story? Who were the people? You know, they talk in the book about having the villain that you're up against and the town folk. Who were the people cheering you on? For me, the villain was two things. Uh, first of all, a lack of inclusion, because uh, my talk looked at diversity in communities, and looked at diversity in schools, um, and looked specifically at integration in schools. Um, but I also think the villain was partly myself, because at the end I identified the fact that when I look into my daughter's classroom, I see that it's a brilliant, beautiful, fabulous, multicultural room, and I love that it is. But I'm also kind of ashamed of the fact that I notice that it's multiculturalism, because my daughter doesn't. She never thinks of it. She has never mentioned the fact that her room is full of lots of people with lots of different, varied ethnicities, background, lineage. But I do notice it. And so I think I'm part of the villain, but I think we're probably only one or two generations away. For me, there's one thing that the book is missing, and that is a one-pager. It is a tick box, and I, I know not, not everything should come down to a checklist, but I think it needs a one-pager where you can say, I need this at the start of my talk, I need this at the end of my talk, and I need this in between. It would be great to be able to, to do a draft of a talk, then go through this and say, uh, uh, oh, I'm missing that. And bring a science to it. Yeah, just be, I think you're right. I think there, there should be a, a hard science to everything. If there isn't evidence behind a book, it kills me. Obviously, this book has been really important to you. If you were summing it up to someone who hadn't read it, what would you say? I would say if you're ever going to speak anywhere, publicly or otherwise, or if you're running your own business and you're pitching or anything, this is the book to read. It's very easy reading and it's full of tips. Yeah, I liked it. It's a good, easy read. Something you can take bits and pieces of, make notes on. And as you say, there's bits of you definitely have to go back and read again to go, how can I apply that? But yeah, no, I like it. And for me, um, I just think that, like a lot of books, and I've said this about virtually every book that we've looked at so far, I don't think it needs to be this long. I really don't. I, for me, so many of the books that we've reviewed in this series so far, I think that they could be stripped down to 25% of their content. Folks, thank you for joining us, Dorcas. Uh, thanks, Laura, for your sum up. But let us know what you thought of this book by liking, commenting, sharing, and subscribing. But also, let us know what your favorite TED Talk was inside the comments. If you interact with us in some way, you could win a copy of this book or a copy of our next book, Persuasion by Robert G. Aldini. How persuasive are you? How can you get people to say that elusive yes that you need? That's what we'll be looking at next time on The Business Book Club. Thank you.